हेलो नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट एंड यू वॉचिंग वैंटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा This week Prime Minister Narendra Modi is heading to Ukraine and it's a crucial time Ukraine has taken the war into Russia it is controlling Russian territory intensifying attacks and taking Russian soldiers in custody Has the war changed course or is this a blip And in the middle of all of this what is Vladimir Putin doing in Azerbaijan we'll discuss all of that In the Kolkata rape and murder case doctors continue to protest the politics continues to heat up and the investigation is focusing on the college principal and an alleged mafia that he ran The world over mpox is spreading countries are screening travelers the WHO has sounded an alarm should you be worried In Pakistan was Imran Khan duped by his wife a new report talks about a nexus between Bushra Bibi and former ISI chief Faiz Hami In the South China Sea ships from Manila and Beijing collide the pictures are dramatic and the prospect of what this might lead to scary In Malaysia the government is backtracking on its orangutan diplomacy we'll explain what's the controversy over the lateral entry of professionals in the Indian bureaucracy What is a rare blue supermoon how and where can you see it and what is slow productivity the new trend that says you achieve more by doing less and that be your monday motivation the headlines first In the US Republicans lodge a formal case for the impeachment of President Biden it coincides with the opening day of the Democratic National Convention the impeachment report accuses Biden of corruption the charges are linked to his son Hunter's foreign business affairs but this political move is unlikely to gain any serious traction The US and South Korea kick off joint military drills. The exercise aims to contain nuclear armed North Korea and fight cyber attacks. Pyongyang has called the drills dangerous and grave. Washington is Seoul's key security ally. More than 28,000 American troops are stationed in South Korea. Kenyan government plans to reinstate some unpopular taxes says it will help them raise over a billion dollars in June the taxes were scrapped after deadly protests. Kenya has a 78 billion dollar debt. Nairobi's credit rating has been downgraded over concerns about its ability to service this debt. A luxury super yacht sinks off the coast of Sicily. At least one person has been killed and six others are missing. UK tech tycoon Mike Lynch is among those who are missing. The boat had 22 people on board when it was hit by a violent storm. And Imran Khan now wants to be the chancellor of Oxford University the former Pakistani prime minister has applied for the job since late August Khan has been in jail last August rather he's been in jail over various corruption charges the cricketer turned politician had studied at Oxford in the 1970s We begin tonight with a war in Ukraine. On Friday, Prime Minister Narendra Modi will be in Kiev. New Delhi announced his visit today. For security reasons, the specifics have not been shared. This is a significant visit. It is happening at a critical juncture. Ukraine's offensive inside Russia is intensifying. Ukrainian soldiers have blown up another Russian bridge. This war is also being fought on Russian territory now. This is the third Russian bridge to be destroyed in the last couple of weeks. These bridges are strategic assets for Moscow. The Russian military uses them to move troops and supplies, which is why Ukraine is targeting them. It is blowing up Russian bridges to disrupt supply routes and cripple the Russian forces. 
Ukraine's offensive has entered its third week, and this will set the tone for the talks between Prime Minister Modi and President Zelensky. India has been asking both sides to try and end the war, so when Modi meets Zelensky, he is expected to do the same again ask Ukraine to ease the tensions. And it will be a timely conversation because Ukraine has plans to escalate this conflict in a big way. Zelensky is pursuing an ambitious goal. All this is more than just defense for Ukraine. It is now our primary task in defensive operations overall to destroy as much Russian war potential as possible and conduct maximum counteroffensive actions. This includes creating a buffer zone on the aggressor's territory, our operation in the Kursk region. So Ukraine wants a buffer zone inside Russia. How much territory does it already control? As of last week, nearly 1,000 square kilometers, it is a small block of Russian land in the Kursk region. Ukraine controls it and it is expanding its operations, targeting other areas close by. Ukraine has also taken Russian prisoners of war, more than 150 of them, have been captured. In fact, uh, Zelensky says the operation is not over. He plans to launch more attacks and capture more Russian territory. Meanwhile, Russian forces are fighting back. Ukrainian soldiers say they're facing stiff resistance. These are soldiers fighting inside Russian territory. Listen in. It's tough. How else could it be? But is it worth it? Yes, soon everything will be awesome. The Korsk nuclear power plant will be ours. How is the situation? In short, it's getting more difficult. The Kursk nuclear plant. That is the next target of Ukraine. It is about 60 kilometers away from Ukraine's border. Russia has already sounded an alarm. It has withdrawn staff from the facility. Russian troops are digging trenches around, around it, around this nuclear plant, hoping to keep the Ukrainian troops away. If Ukraine strikes this nuclear facility in Russia, it will be a dangerous escalation. But why does Ukraine want a Russian nuclear plant? For leverage. For more than two years, Russia has controlled the Zaporizhia nuclear plant in Ukraine. This is Europe's largest nuclear facility. Russia controls it, and Ukraine wants it back. But how do they force the Russians to hand it back? For that, they would need leverage. The nuclear facility in Kursk could provide that. If Ukraine takes it over, it can negotiate a swap, Kursk for Zaporizhia, a nuclear plant for the nuclear plant. It is a risky gamble. Converting nuclear facilities into war zones is never a good idea. The Zaporizhia plant has already seen a lot of fighting in the last two years. Now Kursk could be caught in the crossfire. The IAEA is sounding an alarm. That's the International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA. It's the United Nations nuclear watchdog. It says the safety situation at Japorizia is deteriorating. The plant is coming under repeated attacks. Over the weekend, there was a drone strike nearby. Around a week ago, one of its cooling towers was hit. Ukraine and Russia are trading charges, both blaming each other for the strikes. The IAEA has a team of inspectors near this plant in Ukraine. Their reports are alarming. They say there have been more explosions. They keep hearing firing from machine guns time and again. And this is a very dangerous situation. The fighting in Japorizhia has brought the world on the brink of a nuclear disaster. Now another nuclear plant could be dragged into this war. This is a nightmare in the making and it could get worse because another front may open up in this war. The Ukraine-Belarus border. President Alexander Lukashenko of Belarus says Ukraine has sent more than 100,000 troops there. There are over 120,000 Ukrainian troops on the Belarusian-Ukrainian border. They are keeping them near our border. Seeing their aggressive policy, we have introduced there and placed in certain points, in case of war, they would be defense, our military along the entire border. So Lukashenko is worried about the war spilling into his country. Amid all of this, where is Vladimir Putin? He's visiting Azerbaijan. The Russian president arrived there yesterday. He met the president of Azerbaijan today. Reports say they discussed the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, two former Soviet states at loggerheads over a region called Nagorno-Karabakh. Putin has offered to end the conflict. He spoke briefly about Ukraine as well. He referred to the situation as a crisis. He said he won't let the Ukrainian incursion distract him. So does Vladimir Putin have a Trump card up his sleeve? The world is waiting for his next move.
is whatever, however it is being. Enough is enough. It's been more than one week since the horrific rape and murder in Kolkata and the protests continue. Doctors, advocates, medical students, all of them are on the streets. In West Bengal, most trainee doctors are on strike, especially in state-run colleges. They're refusing to perform non-essential services. Same in New Delhi. Striking doctors gathered outside the health ministry today. They began offering free OPD services there. Sort of like a protest clinic. In Mumbai too, medics are on strike. They want strict laws to ensure their safety at work. Society, as a society, to speak up when I see wrong. To speak up when I see wrong. There are no two voices here. The doctors have found support from all sides. Just look at what happened in Kolkata. Two warring football fans have joined hands. Fans of Mohan Bagan and East Bengal. Both are clubs based in Kolkata. Their fans have historically shared a tense rivalry. But on Sunday, they came together. They stood in solidarity with the protesting doctors. Such images do send a strong message. The question is, how is the government responding? Well, the West Bengal government is not in charge of the probe. That's being done by the CBI, the Central Bureau of Investigation. But the state police have been busy. They're cracking down on social media posts. Around 198 people have gotten, uh, gotten police summons. 198 people have been summoned. This includes two senior doctors in the state. They have been accused of spreading fake news online. I guess the cops are more concerned about optics. But one West Bengal lawmaker went a step ahead. He says doctors are striking for the sake of it and that they're going around with their boyfriends. Frankly, this was the only thing missing. We have seen a heinous crime. We have seen public outrage. What we hadn't seen was this. Crass statements by our politicians. Well, now we have. The state government is pointing fingers at the CBI. They say the investigation is too slow. Meanwhile, the opposition wants the chief minister to resign. As you know, West Bengal is ruled by the Trinamool Congress. The main opposition is the BJP. And the BJP says that Chief Minister Mamata Banerjee must resign. So the politics is unfolding at full speed. And what about the probe? Well, the victim's autopsy details are out. She had 16 external injuries and nine internal ones. The cause of death is manual strangulation. And there, there's also evidence of rape. Which brings us to the CBI probe. Right now, they seem to be focused on one person, Dr. Sandeep Ghosh, the former principal of the RG Carr Medical College. The college where the crime happened, he was the principal. Ghosh has been questioned for three consecutive days. On Sunday, he was grilled for 13 hours. The CBI is also looking into his phone details. Who did he call before the incident and whom did he call afterwards? But why the heat on the principal? Because his colleagues have dropped some explosive, explosive claims about him. They say he ran a mafia inside the college. Things like redirecting dead bodies or extorting money and failing students or even supplying liquor to medics. Did this so-called mafia have something to do with the murder? The victim's colleagues say yes, it did. They claim sinister things were happening at this college and the victim knew too much. I know this sounds like a puzzle falling into place, but remember, all of this is unproven at the moment. The CBI is still probing these angles. Reports say they will conduct a lie detector test tomorrow. On whom? the suspect in custody, the civic volunteer accused of raping and killing the victim. Maybe that will give us more clarity. In the meantime, here's what we can do. Keep up the pressure on authorities, not by sensationalizing or politicizing the incident, but by asking the right questions. Like what security upgrades have been made since the murder? Why was there no on-call room at the hospital? Why was the victim working for 48 hours straight? Doesn't that signal a strain on our health infra? And what about long-term solutions? How do we ensure that hospitals are safe for doctors?
No political party is asking these questions. They are more focused on demanding a death penalty in one week or asking the chief minister to resign. And don't get us wrong, we do need swift justice. We also need accountability for this crime, but that alone will not be enough. We must ensure that such crimes do not happen again. If not, this outrage would have been for nothing. It was the summer of 2022. Countries were still recording cases of the Wuhan virus, but they had a new problem, an M-pox outbreak. The World Health Organization called it a public health emergency. There was panic. Nearly 100,000 people were infected, so the West jumped into action. People were tested, arrivals were screened, vaccines were administered, and the reaction was swift. Soon, M-pox became a thing of the past. By 2023, the World Health Organization said the emergency was over. But was it really? The West may have stamped out the virus, but it was still prevalent in Africa. And two years later, we have a similar situation. Mpox is spreading again. It never really stopped in Africa, and now it is across the globe. Today, the Philippines recorded its first Mpox case. It was a 33-year-old man, and here is the catch. This man has no history of foreign travel, which means just one thing. The virus already exists in the country, and the Philippines is not alone. Sweden detected its first case recently. Pakistan has recorded three cases. In the hospital, we have seven beds for this isolate. The whole ward is full of oxygen concentrators, oxygen, and emergency medicine, IV fluids, scanulas, antibiotics, antipyretics, which we need to take care of these patients. All are available. Inshallah, there is no case here. If there is no case here, there is no issue. We have all the arrangements. Pakistan is monitoring its arrivals. So is China. It is screening travelers, which brings us to India. Are we at risk? Until now, no Mpox cases have been detected in India. The Prime Minister himself is said to be monitoring the situation. The Health Ministry says the risk is low, but it's still keeping a tab on all travelers. So to sum it up, Mpox on the rise, Cases across the globe, countries on high alert, the WHO sounding an alarm. Since January, nearly 19,000 cases have been recorded. There have been more than 540 deaths. Is this another pandemic in the making or do we have nothing to worry about? Well, let's look at the disease first. What is Mpox? Mpox was first discovered in 1958 in a colony of monkeys. That's where it got its first name, monkey pox, Mpox. In 1970, the first human case was detected in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The patient was an infant. Now, this virus is zoonotic, meaning it spreads from infected animals to people. The symptoms include fever, muscle ache, and large boil-like skin lesions. In fact, it's the most obvious sign of Mpox. And how does it spread? It's usually through close contact. If you're too close to an infected person or have skin-to-skin -skin contact, chances are you will get it. But is it deadly? Well, there are two subtypes to this virus, clade one and clade two. In the 2022 outbreak was led by clade two, which is less severe. The infection is usually mild. You recover in two to four weeks. But this time it's the clade one variant, which is deadlier. Plus there's also a mutation, clade one B. It leads to death in 4% of all cases, which brings us to the cure. How do you treat Mpox? There are no antiviral drugs. But we do have vaccines. The most common is the Bavarian Nordics two-dose vaccine. It is authorized for use against Mpox. Plus, there's ACAM 2000. It's a smallpox vaccine, but it is used as a cross shot, meaning it works for Mpox too. Now, countries already stockpile ACAM 2000 for national security. You see, we eradicated smallpox in 1980. The world eradicated it. But if it ever resurfaces, the vaccine can be used, which is why countries store it. 
and not just this one. Nations usually stockpile all kinds of smallpox shots. Most of these can be used against mpox. But here's the problem. None of these vaccines is in Africa. I would not recommend a general vaccination campaign for the general population or, or at-risk populations at this stage. It is also clear that the vaccines that are available globally are urgently needed in Africa, are urgently needed in, in regions where the virus currently is spreading, and there is a severe shortage of vaccines. Mpox broke out in Africa. It's an, an endemic in the continent. The DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, has recorded more than 15,000 cases. The virus spread to Burundi, Cameroon, Congo, Rwanda, South Africa, Kenya, and Uganda. So it's all over the continent. Yes, yet they don't have the vaccines. And this is not the first time that Africa has been left out. In, by 2022, you would remember, all wealthy nations had Wuhan virus vaccines. Half of the world's population had been vaccinated, but Africa was left behind. Only 15% Africans were vaccinated. Two years on, we haven't learned our lesson clearly. Mpox is not too contagious. We have the vaccines. It's a disease that can be easily controlled. It should have been contained with regular testing and vaccination. Yet, the world botched up. To avoid a repeat, the West must stop hoarding vaccines. Until Africa gets them, the world will always be at risk. No one's safe until everyone's safe. We learned this the hard way during the pandemic. It's time to put that in practice. Now let's turn our attention to Pakistan, where an absurd story is doing the rounds. The tale involves power, premonitions, and a plot by the ISI. That's the Inter-Services Intelligence, Pakistan's notorious military-run intelligence agency. Now before I begin the story, I must warn you, the story was published by Pakistani media, the revelations were attributed to anonymous sources, so maybe take them with a whole fistful of salt. With that out of the way, let's dive into the report. What does it say? It claims that there was a nexus in place to dupe Imran Khan, Pakistan's former prime minister. Apparently, he was duped. He's been in jail for over a year now. And who were the people who'd winking him? Well, there was Pakistan's former ISI chief, Faiz Hamid, and Imran Khan's own wife, Bushra Bibi. The report says that Hamid would contact Bushra Bibi and give her clandestine information. Bushra Bibi would then relay this information to Imran Khan. But here is the kicker. Bushra Bibi would pretend that she received the information via divine inspiration. Yes, like a vision of the future, that's what the report claims. That Bushra Bibi was some sketchy soothsayer and Imran Khan, Pakistan's former prime minister, was gullible enough to believe her. And this whole charade was orchestrated by Faiz Hamid, the former head of the ISI. Now think about what you've just heard. The ridiculousness of this entire scenario, the head of state of the fifth most populous country in the world was apparently duped by his own spy chief and his wife. The story is beyond absurd, so why would anyone bother making something like this up? Well, here is the catch. It may actually be plausible. If you consider Imran Khan's and Bushra Bibi's past, some of it makes sense. Bushra Bibi was once known as Pinky Peer. Peer is a spiritual guide or saint. They're revered in the Sufi tradition of Islam. Bushra Bibi is believed to be a peer from the shrine of Baba Farid, a venerated Sufi saint who is interred at Pakistan's Park Patan city. Bushra Bibi was born Bushra Riyaz Wattu. Her family has had connections to the shrine for generations. She was considered a peer or oracle for the shrine, providing spiritual guidance for people who went there, even making predictions about their futures. Imran Khan has been a devotee of Baba Farid for years now. He would keep making secret trips to the shrine, seeking guidance, often from Bushra Bibi. He apparently really believed in her divine abilities. Imran Khan's former wife, Reham Khan, published a tell-all memoir a few years ago, and she wrote that Imran was introduced to a female peer in 2014, and that it led him, and I'm quoting, it led him to another level of absurdity. That peer was Bushra Bibi. Eventually, Imran Khan and Bushra Bibi got married. He then became Pakistan's prime minister. He made Faiz Hamid the ISI chief, and they ruled the country until they angered the military. 
Remember, Pakistan is not a real democracy. Politicians are just puppets that the military hides behind. And it seems that Imran Khan, Bushra Bibi and Faiz Hamid annoyed the real people in charge. Imran Khan was ousted from his post in 2022. He was imprisoned last August. He's been in jail ever since. No matter how many times he gets bail, a new criminal case magically appears and he stays in the slammer. This happened again today. And Bushra Bibi is suffering the same fate. The one-time peer is also in prison. She's yet to foresee a way out. And things are getting worse for the couple. Bushra Bibi's alleged handler has also joined them in prison. Fez Hamid was picked up a few days ago. He's awaiting a court martial. Imran Khan fears that Hamid will be made to testify against him. And if the new reports are true, Bushra Bibi will also be wary of what Hamid might say. So that is the situation in Pakistan right now. An imprisoned former prime minister, a purported seer in shackles, and a dubious former spy chief with strange designs on power. You can't make this up. Anywhere else, this would be a scandal. But in the junta run Pakistan, it's just a regular Monday. On to Bangladesh now, where the problems of Sheikh Hasina and her party, the Awami League, are compounding. A war crimes tribunal will now investigate Sheikh Hasina. She has been accused of mass murder of students during the anti-government protests held recently. The legal scrutiny is intensifying against her party, the Awami League, too. A writ petition has been filed to ban this party. The student protesters sense an opportunity here. They want to fill the political vacuum in Bangladesh by forming a new political party. Our next report tells you more. Awami League and Sheikh Hasina were once the symbol of stability in Bangladesh. But today, the party that was born out of the freedom struggle faces the scenario of a total collapse. <laughs> Top leaders have disappeared. Grassroots members have gone into hiding. Party offices in various locations have been burnt down. And the lawsuits are piling on. Many former ministers and MPs are facing legal scrutiny now. Reports say they are unable to find any lawyer to defend them in the courts. Legal troubles for Sheikh Hasina are growing as well. She's now a named defendant in as many as 15 lawsuits including serious charges like mass murder. A war crime tribunal will now look into the charges against her. These cases have triggered speculation if Dhaka would demand the extradition of Hasina from New Delhi. Her stay in uh, Delhi, uh, in, in India, um, the question comes that since there are so many cases, uh, there could be, I, uh, again some speculating, I am not the person right to answer this. If there is a request from there, we have to ask for her, uh, you know, return to Bangladesh. If there is a... Today, one more suit was filed before a high court in Bangladesh. It calls for a ban on the Awami League and demands that Sheikh Hasina's name should be removed from every state institution that's named after her. The judges will determine the direction of these lawsuits. But Mohammed Yunus, the chief advisor of Bangladesh, has already issued an indictment against Hasina. The caretaker leader has accused her of compromising every institution in Bangladesh. Sheikh Hasina dictatorship destroyed every institution of the country. Judiciary is broken. Democratic rights suppressed through a brutal decade and a half long crackdowns in every way. Elections were rigged blatantly. Generations of young people grew up without exercising their voting rights. Eunice now wants to undertake sweeping reforms first. This means the plans for an early election will have to take a back seat. This delay could allow time for a new political force to emerge in Bangladesh. The student protesters, those who forced Sheikh Hasina out of power, are considering entering politics. They are mulling plans to form their own political outfit. So why are they considering this move? Since independence, two parties have controlled the politics of Bangladesh. The Awami League of Sheikh Hasina and the Bangladesh Nationalist Party of Khalid Azia. 
the student protesters feel this duopoly should end and Bangladesh needs more political alternatives. The protests have given them momentum and popular support. But the student protesters want to take their time and hold wide-ranging consultations before making their next move. Things are heating up in the South China Sea. We've seen multiple naval skirmishes recently. Today we saw another one. It involves the same two players, China and the Philippines. Their ships collided with each other today. Let's pull up the map first. This incident happened near the Sabina Shoal, a part of the disputed Spratly Islands. Two Philippine ships were sailing in these waters today. Manila says Chinese Coast Guard vessels attacked them. They rammed into both Philippine ships. Beijing has released a video of this incident. Take a look. So who is to blame here? Well, that depends on who you ask. China claims most of the South China Sea, but no one buys their claim, not even the United Nations. Plus, it's not just China and the Philippines. You have Taiwan, Vietnam, Indonesia and Malaysia. All of them claim a piece of these waters. So it's basically a floating powder keg. Someone tried to light the fuse today. The only question is who? Both sides are blaming each other. Morning, uh, Philippine Coast Guard vessels encountered unlawful and aggressive maneuvers from Chinese Coast Guard vessels while en route to Patag and Lawak Islands in the West Philippine Sea. <coughs> These dangerous maneuvers resulted in collision, causing structural damage to both Coast Guard vessels. On August 19, two Philippine maritime police vessels intruded into the maritime territory near China's Sienbin Reef of Arnansha Islands without the permission of the Chinese government. Despite warnings from the Chinese maritime police vessels, they intentionally rammed the on-site law enforcement vessels of the Chinese maritime police in a dangerous manner. Normally, this would be front-page news, a skirmish in the high seas. So why wasn't it? Because it was always on the cards. China has been stepping up pressure in the South China Sea. First, they harassed Filipino fishing vessels. Then they clashed and tailed Philippine patrol ships. Then they fired water cannons at them. And now a collision. The question is, what next? Beijing spent the last decade expanding its navy. They have more than 700 vessels now. It is by far the largest navy in the world. So China's ambition is clear. Cement their claims over the South China Sea, which means more such clashes and misadventures. Just one problem, though. There will be pushback. Today's clash is a clear example of that. Southeast Asian countries will not peacefully accept China's claims. So does Beijing have a solution? Well, yes and no. China's first strategy was trade. Most Southeast Asian nations depend on Chinese supply chains. China is their largest trading partner. So the assumption was they would roll over, that Beijing could leverage trade to secure territory. Again, just one problem. These are proud and independent countries. You can't just buy them off. Just look at Vietnam, for example. Their president is visiting China right now. Xi Jinping rolled out a red carpet for him. China has always regarded Vietnam as a priority in its neighborhood diplomacy. China supports Vietnam in adhering to the leadership of the party, taking a socialist path that suits its national conditions, and deepening reform, opening up, and socialist modernization. Vietnam got a new president in May 2024. This is his first foreign trip after taking office and looks like it went well. He signed 14 deals with Xi Jinping. He also got a grand welcome at the Great Hall. Both China and Vietnam are communist nations, plus China is Vietnam's largest trading partner. So at first glance, 
it looks like a great relationship. But if you look closely, it's not all rosy. Both Vietnam and China claim ownership of the Spratly Islands. Vietnam is building artificial islands there. They're actively undermining Chinese claims. Same with the Philippines. China remains their largest trading partner, but they clash over territory. Of course, each country has a different response. Vietnam is not taking China on directly, but they are diversifying. Vietnam upgraded its relations with the US last year. Their prime minister visited India last month. So Hanoi is keeping its options open. The Philippines has taken a more blunt approach, perhaps because of the US. Manila is a treaty ally of Washington. US President Joe Biden has promised to defend the Philippines from aggression. Maybe that explains their confidence. Both these countries face the same problem, Chinese expansionism. But their response is different. The question is, for how much longer? So far, these clashes have not resulted in deaths. Minor injuries, but no deaths. But at this rate, who knows? China is betting on the age-old rule of politics that trade can prevent conflicts. But every country has red lines. You can't ask governments to ignore expansionism for trade. It never plays well with the domestic audience. So Beijing is playing a dangerous game in the South China Sea. It has rolled, rolled in a barrel filled with gunpowder and is now sitting atop with a matchstick. One wrong move could set things off. Our next story is about Malaysia and their orangutan diplomacy. An orangutan is a great ape, almost human-like in intelligence, and indigenous to just Malaysia, Indonesia, and Brunei. Malaysia had initially planned to gift orangutans to countries who purchased palm oil from them. It would have been their version of animal diplomacy, similar to how China gifts pandas to some countries. But yesterday there was a U-turn. After weeks of hue and cry by conservationists, Malaysia is backtracking on its orangutan diplomacy plan. Instead of gifting the great apes, it now plans to partner with some countries to conserve the animals at home. Here's our report. I have decided that our orangutan diplomacy means the orangutans cannot leave their natural habitat. We have to keep them here, and then we will engage with the countries or buyers of our palm oil. If they wish to collaborate in ensuring that the orangutans are protected and preserved forever, we invite them to come and participate in the conservation of their natural habitat here. That was Malaysia's Plantations and Commodities Minister. In the span of a few months, he's made a major U-turn. In May this year, the same minister had made an announcement. He had come up with a scheme to boost Malaysia's palm oil exports. He said that countries who bought Malaysian palm oil would get to adopt orangutans. These great apes are found only on two islands in the world, the island of Sumatra in Indonesia and the island of Borneo, which is divided between Indonesia, Malaysia and Brunei. Orangutans are considered critically endangered. There are barely about a hundred thousand left. These animals have been dying due to deforestation, primarily caused by the palm oil industry. Malaysia and Indonesia are the world's largest exporters of palm oil. They depend on it for economic growth. In 2022, about 5% of Malaysia's GDP came from the palm oil sector. So it's crucial for the country. Palm oil comes from oil palm trees. To make room for these trees, Malaysia has been cutting down its natural rainforests and replacing them with oil palm plantations. This has led to a loss of natural habitats for orangutans. And that is why they are fast disappearing. In May, Malaysia's plantations minister came up with his controversial orangutan diplomacy plan. He wanted to give the animals to countries that were importing palm oil, therefore indirectly contributing to the destruction of their habitats. But remember, these are endangered animals. Removing them from their homes may further harm them. Which is why the plan was panned by conservationists. So the Malaysian government is tweaking its plan. Now, instead of shipping the apes off, it'll work to conserve them at home. Palm oil buyers will now be given an option to help in orangutan conservation by adopting them and donating money for their well-being. Once we know where are the forests, the small forest patches, and where we have orangutans, we can start approaching the owner of the patches of forest 
explain to them why it's important to create corridors of forest, where to set them up and so forth. To do that, we need funding. The new scheme may help bring in conservation funds, but it doesn't really address the root cause of the problem. Palm oil exports will continue. More forests may get destroyed to make way for oil palm plantations, and orangutans will keep dying. The new orangutan diplomacy scheme seems to just be delaying their demise. It offers importers a chance to feel better about themselves, while they continue to indirectly fuel the orangutan's extinction. Bureaucrats can make or break countries. They can be nimble and innovative or slow and hindering. In India, it's often been considered the second. Not all bureaucrats, of course, but the institution in general. It's often seen as rigid and old-fashioned. So the government has been pushing a solution, lateral entries. Normally, the central bureaucracy is made up of career civil servants, basically your IAS officers, but lateral entrants are outsiders, maybe from the private sector or from public sector, sector companies, or maybe even research institutes. And the idea is quite simple. These outsiders bring in a lot of experience and domain knowledge, something that career bureaucrats may lack. The first such appointment was made in 2018, and since then, 63 lateral appointments have been made. But why are we talking about it now? Because another round is coming up. The UPSC has issued an advertisement. That's the Union Public Service Commission, UPSC. They recruit officers to all bureaucratic positions. Their latest ad is for 45 roles, those of joint secretaries, directors and deputy secretaries. 45 such roles in 24 ministries. Now, just to give you an idea, a joint secretary is the third highest rank in a, in a department. So these are not paper pushers. These are decision-making roles. The hope is that these lateral entrants will bring fresh ideas but it's not a done deal yet, because the opposition is against this policy. They have called it an attack on Dalits, OBCs and Adivasis. Again, explanations are in order. Normally, UPSC recruitments are subject to reservation. Seats are reserved for certain groups, like 27% for OBCs and 15% for scheduled castes. But not in lateral appointments. There is no quota in the system. So the appointment is purely based on merit. And why is that? Because technically, this is not a mass recruitment. Yes, 45 jobs are up for grabs, but each role has been advertised separately. Hence, quotas do not apply. Now, the opposition's criticism may not worry the government, but some of its own allies are unhappy too. Like Chirag Paswan of the Lok Janashakti Party, he's called it a completely wrong decision. And he plans to take it up with the government. So are these objections purely political? To answer that, let's first focus on the idea, what are the pros and cons of lateral entry? Two advantages clearly stand out. First is manpower. The central government needs more than 1,400 IS officers. They need more than 1,400 officers. That is the required strength. And how many do they actually have? 442. So there is a massive shortage of manpower and lateral entries could solve that. That's the first advantage. Advantage number two, expertise and experience. Just consider the Department of Telecommunications. It requires a lot of domain knowledge. Professionals will have that. Academics or researchers will have that. But a career bureaucrat may not. And this is not a complaint. It is a fact. Professionals have spent decades studying these issues, so naturally they will bring more to the table. Which brings us to the cons. The obvious one is bias. A normal recruitment drive is based on marks and interviews but lateral entries can be influenced. You can put your allies in top positions or worse, your family members. So that is one drawback. Secondly, it could be a cultural shock. Government secretariats work in a certain way which is very different from companies, so professionals may not be able to adjust. Some experts also think that there could be resentment. Career bureaucrats work for decades to reach a position, but a lateral entry may just swoop in, which could lead to friction. Now, these are the technical arguments for and against the system. Of course, the political argument is much bigger, but that's no reason to abandon the entire idea. A lot of countries, in fact, already use the system, like the US, Germany, France, South Korea. Their governments appoint senior bureaucrats and agency heads. 
But there's a catch here. When the governments change, so do the bureaucrats. So India will have to find a balance. There must be transparency. There must be strong checks and maybe a wider discussion. We say it's a good idea that needs refinement. Tonight will be a treat for sky gazers. If it's already dark where you are, try looking out at the skies. You may witness what's called a rare blue supermoon. It combines two lunar events, the rare occurrence of a blue moon and the impressive sight of a supermoon. But what are these events? And why do they hold such fascination? Also, how rare is this celestial event? Our next report answers all your questions. The moon, it's a constant celestial companion. Since the dawn of time, humans have gazed up at it. But once in a while, the moon gives us a spectacle, one that captivates millions, like this rare blue supermoon. So does that mean the moon will be blue? Well, not really. The lunar cycle is 29.5 days, but months are usually 30 or more days. Usually, you get one full moon every month, but once in a while, it gets out of sync. That gives you two full moons in just a month. That second full moon is known as a blue moon. Usually, it happens every two and a half years. On its own, a blue moon is a marvel. But this one is coinciding with a supermoon. What's that? We all know the moon orbits the Earth. But this orbit isn't exactly circular. So at one point it will be at the closest to the Earth. That's a supermoon. It appears 14% bigger and almost 30% brighter than a regular full moon. It's going to be getting higher and further west as the night progresses and it's going to be up all night long. So really, you don't need any equipment at all. It's big and it's bright, it's beautiful. But if you do have a pair of binoculars or a telescope, it can help you to point out some of those beautiful features on the surface. About 25% of all full moons are supermoons, but only 3% of full moons are blue moons. So a blue supermoon is a truly extraordinary celestial event. The next one will be in 2037. So for many sky gazers, this is a dream come true. But beyond its visual beauty, the blue supermoon has cultural significance. For ancient civilizations, the moon was more than a celestial body. It was a thing of myth, a timekeeper and a symbol of fertility. Its gravitational pull affects the ocean's tides, human biology and even our psychological state. So a blue supermoon was viewed as extraordinary, worthy of rituals and celebrations. We've come a long way since then. The moon has become a frontier of exploration. Humans landed there and they're now planning to go back. The idea is to establish permanent bases there. But no matter how much we advance, the blue supermoon will always be a reminder of the mysteries that still lie ahead. And the beauty that comes from just looking up. Do you want more? More money, more success, more joy? If yes, congratulations, you are human. But more importantly, what are you doing about it? Possibly more of everything, more work, more thinking, more effort, which might help you reap the benefits. If you strive for bigger goals, there is a higher chance of achieving success. But there's also a flip side. The improvements are endless, the tasks are ceaseless, and they come with side effects like burnout. Today, one in four workers are burnt out the world over. So what if we go the opposite way? Could doing less be the key to achieving more? It's a new week, and we have a new term for you. Slow productivity. Apparently, it is all the rage, from books to TikToks. It is the new buzzword for productivity gurus and Gen Z workers alike. So what is slow productivity? It refers to producing high quality work, but working less. I know it sounds contradictory, so let's break this down for you. Slow productivity has three tenets. One, do fewer things. Two, work at your natural pace. And three, focus on quality. 
Sounds like a lazy person's fantasy, but just think about it. We seem to work all the time. We're always on, checking emails, attending Zoom calls. But are we productive? Well, according to data, not particularly. 37% of Gen Z workers have low productivity. So do 30% of millennials and 22% of Gen X. So if you're busy all the time, why aren't we getting more work done? Because we tend to focus on busy work, small, relatively less important tasks that seem urgent in the moment. They take up your time and energy, but offer little in return. For example, worker, workers spend two whole days a week on meetings and emails alone, and often we are not even checking those emails, we are doom scrolling on our phones. An average person spends about three hours doing this every day, so we are busy without really getting work done. Is slowing down and doing less the answer? Experts say it is, not only for your physical and emotional health, but also your capacity to deliver. It can boost your performance, it can increase your ability to concentrate. So how does one slow down? The key is to prioritize, doing lesser while carefully choosing what to do and doing it at your own pace. Now slow productivity may be a new term, but the concept has, has existed forever. Its proponents include famous scientists like Galileo Galilei, Isaac Newton and Marie Curie. They shaped the world of science, but they were known to work at their own pace and include periods of rest during their research. So why don't we do it? Why do we need fancy terms and TikTok trends to learn how to prioritize? Because it is not easy. Most of us lead full lives packed with careers, chores, children, social obligations, and so on. So we are juggling work with caring responsibilities at home. And we try to do all of it all the time. Also, often things are not in our control. For instance, a lawyer cannot necessarily push a court date. We all struggle with unrealistic deadlines at work. So unless all bosses everywhere are practicing slow productivity, this concept would be a hard sell. Not everyone can practice it, obviously, and certainly not all the time, but it's worth giving it a shot. It all boils down to identifying what not to do. Saying no to all the things that don't really matter so you can say yes to the things that do matter and you have the bandwidth to do them better. Today's Raksha Bandhan in India, the day you remember why you have childhood trauma. I am kidding, of course. It's a festival that celebrates the brother-sister bond. We have some rituals on this day. Women tie a bracelet or rakhi on their brothers' hands, while men are supposed to give gifts to their sisters. How simple and elegant. But Raksha Bandhan is not just a festival, it is also a ceasefire, a one-day pause in the years-long sibling rivalry. And guess who's absolutely loving it? The siblings, yes. But also instant grocery apps. I'm talking about the likes of Blinkit and Swiggy. They sold nearly 700,000 rakis per minute. Again, how elegant. Nothing says love, like a stranger delivering rakis from a cloud store. Then again, I guess it's better than nothing. Take a look at how the internet celebrated rakhi. फिर कितने चाहिए? दस करोड़। दस करोड़। This is business. This is my swag. I know, but I did business. पांच सौ रुपये ले आया था। हाँ, तो पांच सौ देने, पांच सौ देने। पैसा ही पैसा होगा। कोई तरीका है भीख मांगने का? फिर से आ गए रे बाबा, इधर ज़हर खाने का पैसा नहीं है, तू जा रे। कहाँ से पैसे? मुझे नहीं मालूम कहाँ से? मालूम नहीं तेरे का, तेरे का मालूम नहीं।
it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. Pro-Palestinian supporters march through Chicago ahead of the Democratic National Convention. Multiple wildfires break out in a popular tourist destination in Turkey. And the animals of the London Zoo hop on to the scales for the annual weigh-in. Finally, we are taking you back in history on this day. In 1953, a CIA-assisted coup overthrew the government in Iran. It was against Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh. The coup restored power to Iran Shah, who was an American ally. In 2023, the CIA admitted that its actions were undemocratic. We're leaving you on that note. Thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Across continents, one powerful news source. Bringing you diverse perspectives on the issues that matter. We go beyond the boundaries to give you that little extra about every sporting moment. So thank you for making First Post 5 million strong. We're counting on your support and you can trust us to bring you the news unfiltered and unvarnished. Climate change is on our doorstep. It's time for a revolution to take root. And it starts with 1.4 billion Indians. It starts with one tree. One tree for humanity. One tree for Mother Earth. One tree for our future. Project One Tree, a News 18 network initiative. Hello and welcome to First Post America. I'm Eric Ham, coming to you live from the nation's 
capital.